Hi everyone, my name is Tamashi and I'm here with Nia from Boston Ujima Project. Um, and welcome back to the Brown 2 Book Club where we gather together to read and discuss Brown 2, originally published in 2021 by the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University and reprinted in 2022 by Boston Ujima Project as part of the Ashe Ashe Cultural Assembly Grant. We read together from 1,000 word transcripts of 2020 interviews with discussant contributors, Matt Kreger, Tamiko Brown-Nagan, David J. Harris, Donna Bivens, Nia K. Evans, Rashida Richardson, Meredith Whitaker, and Sabelo Sethu Mlambi. During the COVID-19 public health crisis lockdown of 2020, I had the pleasure to work with an extraordinary team of research assistants at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute for Advanced, Start for Advanced Study to use Zoom to ask questions about education advocacy histories before and after the Brown, the Brown v. Board of Education II Supreme Court decision of 1955. This case had to do with implementing desegregation of public schools with quote, all deliberate speed. We worked together in physical isolation, transcribing the conversations to make a book. Here it is. Ours was the only project to continue at the Institute during that unprecedented time. When the book was published, members of the general public and the Harvard community at large were invited to request copies that were each sent by mail from the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. When Harvard campus reopens, when Harvard camp, let me let me not handle the door. When Harvard camp, when Harvard campus reopens, visitors of Brown Two of the Brown Two exhibition in the Kulukundisk Family Gallery received copies of the book in person. Nearly one thousand books were given out in 2021. Now the Boston Ujima Project's Ashe Ashe Cultural Assembly Grant has funded a second printing of Brown Two for Boston Ujima Project, uh, for Boston Ujima members and in the greater Boston area and to reunite all of us to return together from all over the world, to return to the text all over the world. If you don't yet have a hard copy of the book and wanna read along with us, you can use this link. I'm dropping it in the chat now. And hi again to Young Joy, who's joining us from Meg and Matt and Joy's house. All right, let's get started with simple instructions in the room. Um, or I'm sorry, with simple introductions in the room. We're gonna go around the room and uh, give our name. Gonna ask, what is your name? And if you'd like to specify, what pronouns do you prefer? If you don't, that's also fine. Where in the world are you logging in from? Let's get started with Matt, a face I am always so excited to see. The same, Tamashi. I'm Matt Krager. And I'm logging in from Dorchester, Massachusetts. All right, Matt, why don't you pass it to someone? I'm going to pass it to Nia. Thank you, Matt. And it's good to see you, too. I'm really uh, excited about tonight. And I'm Nia. I use she, her pronouns. And I am uh, logging in from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I'm going to pass it to LaToya. Hi. I'm Latoya. I use the she series pronouns. I'm logging in from Dorchester as well. Hi, Matt. Um, and this is August, my youngest here, who's joining me. And and I'm gonna pass it to Jason. Hey, how's everybody doing? This is uh, Jason, uh, and I'm uh, or he him, and I'm um, logging in from Dorchester, USA. And uh, I'll pass it to Sierra. Hi, everyone. My name is Sierra Peters. I use she, they pronouns, and I am logging in from the People's Republic of Brooklyn. Uh, I will pass it to Jillian. Hi, I'm Jillian. I'm here, uh, she, her. I'm here from the Berkshires, Western Massachusetts. And I will pass it to Camilla. Camila. Hi, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Camila. I use she and they, uh, and I'm logging in from Roslindale. And I'm going to pass it to Sylvia. Hi, all. Happy New Year. I'm Sylvia. I use she, her pronouns. I'm here in Fenway right now. I will pass it to Ruiz. Yeah, I'm Louise, and I'm logging in from uh, South Boston, Massachusetts. 
And I guess I'll pass it to Sylvia. Hi, Louise. I actually just want, feel free to. Oh, uh, Denise. Then I'll do it. Denise, turn it. Hey, Louise. Thank you. <clears throat> everybody. I'm Denise. I use she, her, and I'm logging in from Roslindale. And I will pass it to Connie. You're muted, Connie. I'm Connie and I'm in New York. <laughs> Hi. Oh, and I'm Pat, I have Pat, I don't know who has gone yet. Nia, pass, pass it to somebody. I'll pass it, I'll pass it to Jason. Did you win already, Jason? Oh, okay. I'll pass it to Sabello. Hi, everyone. Um, Sabello here. Uh, he, I'm calling from Cape Town, South Africa, where 2.30 a.m. and I'm trying to be awake, but glad to be here. I will pass it to Mariana. Hi, I'm Marion. My pronouns are she, hers, um, and I'm calling in from Chicago. I will pass it on to Joy and Meg. My name is Joy. What pronouns? And I'm she, her. Who's your buddy? And I'm Meg, um, with the she series, and, and um, we're calling in from Roslindale, which seems like it's well represented tonight. Sure. This is our dog, Buddy. Yeah. And I'll pass it to um, Perla. Or Perla. Yep. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, everyone. I'm Perla. Say them. And I am currently in the South End. And I will pass it to. Not 100% sure who has gone. Let's throw it to Donna. Perfect. Donna. Hi, everybody. I'm Donna. I'm here in Roxbury. Glad to see everybody. And let's go to Herman. Sorry. Good evening, everybody. My name is Herman. Uh, my pronoun, if I have one, is it. And I'm, I'm happy to be here to see y'all all. I saw you in my calendar and I'm gonna find, I thought, like the subject matter. And so like, I'm doing that. I'll pass it to the next available person. I don't know who available, but let's have fun tonight. Let's, uh, let's uh, throw it to Ray. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ray, I use they, them pronouns and I'm calling from Lynn, Massachusetts and I'll pass it to Gio. Hi, everybody. I go by Gio. I use he him pronouns, community engagement manager alongside Mary, and I'm calling in from Dorchester. Uh, and uh, another shout out to South Africa tonight. I will pass it forward to, I'll just pass it forward to Mary. Hi, oh, my name is Mary. I'm coming in from Cambridge. I'm going to pass it to Moline. Hi, everybody. My name is Moline, and I am in New Haven, which is on the ancestral lands of the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin people, speaking peoples. I am not sure who. Um, hmm. Let's pass Matthew, it. Matthew, did you oh. go? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm keeping track. Let's pass okay. it to Slandy. Slandy didn't go yet, right? Hello. Um, I forgot to update my name. I go by Blue. So happy to be here. Um, and right now I'm calling from Boston, um, Massachusetts, um, Pawtucket land, and... I'm not sure if there's anything else that I need to say. Sorry, I wasn't paying 100% attention. Oh, no, that's fine. Thank you. You got it. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah. Let's pass it to Josie. You haven't gone yet, right, Josie? 
No, I'm Joshi. I'm sorry I'm late. I just got home from work and thrilled to be here. And I will pass it to, um, oh, I used she, they, that's fine. Uh, Louise? Where are you, Joshi? Oh, I'm place. in Chicago. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Chicago. Ooh. And Louise went. So oh, sorry. Let's, oh, no, no worries. Um, let's pass it to Cardina. And you're muted, Cardina. Cardina. Uh, unmuting myself. I just unmuted. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm a little late on the call. Um, where are you? Where are you calling in from, Cardina? Oh, I'm calling in from uh, Boston neighborhood, Jamaica Plain. All right, excellent. Um, I don't think Carm has gone yet. I haven't. Thank you. Um, I'm Carmelite. I'm calling in from um, Brighton, Mass. Um, but yeah. And I'm not sure, Jillian, have you gone? Okay, you have gone. So I think we have one more, um, Jamin, am I pronouncing it correctly? Yeah, hi, I'm Jamin. Um, I use he, him pronouns. I'm logging in from Fort Worth, Texas. And also, uh, my name is Njobe Dugas. I'm the only person representing uh, the West Coast, Oakland, California. Hello, uh, East Coast, Midwest, and was that South Africa? Good to be here. All right, awesome. Is that everyone, Nia? Sweet. Okay, thank you, everyone. This is fantastic. Let's start reading. We will start with Matt's chapter. Let's turn to page 18 and the hard copy. And Nia, or sheesh, I didn't open the PDF for myself. Um, my apologies. If anyone has the PDF open and can tell us what page we're starting with in the PDF, that would be super great. Um, if not, it's okay, I'm opening it up. Uh, thank you, page 21 in the PDF. And I should actually share screen for anyone who might be having difficulty. And I will do that. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Mm. Uh, Nia had said that I couldn't be on a uh, screen share because uh, while well, another participant is um, um, sharing. Are you trying to share your screen, Tamashi? Yeah, um, it's all right, y'all. Oh, okay. um, I just have a lot open on my um, on my desktop. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okie dokie. Let's boogie. Okay, everyone ready? Yes. Um, awesome. So. Um, I'm just going to start by introducing uh, our first chapter's discussant. So we're going into on the case history before and after Brown v. Board of Education with Matt Kreger. Matt Kreger is a civil rights attorney who has practiced education law with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Southern, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and now the Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee. In these roles, Professor Kreger has worked on a host of K through 12 and higher education issues, including racial harassment, voluntary integration, admissions, teacher diversity, school funding, special education, and school discipline. Professor Kreger is proudest of the work he has done in partnership with community organizations, including his work with the parent-led, student-led, and educator-led base building groups of the National Dignity in Schools campaign to secure federal school discipline reform during the Obama administration. He has served on education-related advisory groups for the Council of State Governments, New York State Permanent Judicial Commission, um, on Justice for Children, Northeastern University, and Boston Public Schools, among others. Matt is a former public school teacher and the 2018 recipient of the Boston Bar Association's John G. Brooks Legal, Legal Services Award. Um, so that's the current bio. 
back in 2020, <laughs> there's so much. So back in 2020, what we knew then was that Matt had served as an education project director for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice. He was assistant counsel. Is it all pretty much the same? Yeah. It's about the same. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. um, and so what happened was Matt um, provided, provides, in, in this chapter, Matt provides an overview of the case law leading up to and following Brown v. Board of Education. His commentary lends insight into the legal strategy of the NAACP attorneys, the massive resistance and failures of implementation following the 1955 Brown II decision, and how enduring educational inequalities forced another round of legal contests in the 1960s and 1970s, which Kreger refers to here as basically Brown III. His, his, this history makes clear that the legal fight to end segregation did not begin or end with Brown v. Board of Education. So I'm gonna pass it on to whomever is ready to start reading. And we'll just say you can either um, raise your hand to read or write stack in the chat if you'd like to read next. And uh, each person is reading two paragraphs at a time. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> um oh well, so sabello asked for stack in the chat so let's throw it in the chat so let's throw it to him all right thank you um do i read the the pleasant versus ferguson part the great part or just the the black text you read it all everything everything uh, here cool cool all right so before brown 1896 to 1950 Plessy versus Ferguson, 163 U.S. 537, 1896. This Supreme Court decision upheld racial segregation through the separate but equal doctrine, ruling that Louisiana's segregated railway, railway carriages did not violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment because separate but equal facilities were available for Black travelers. This was the first challenge under the Equal Protection Clause to segregated facilities. Quite sadly, it was a full-throated victory for the segregationist Jim Crow efforts that were pervasive not just across the Deep South, but across the entire country. The U.S. Supreme Court basically declared segregation fully constitutional under the same amendment that had been designed to protect the rights of Black people and all people in this country. The justice system, as it had done so many times, talk itself out of following our own laws in a way that would actually give them the meaning intended. A lot of distance and reflection came after Plessy versus Ferguson. Was the law even an option to address this? And if so, how could the words of the constitution be used after they'd been eviscerated by this case in a way that would secure equality under law for black people in the United States? Dina? Yes? You called Stack, right? In the chat? You're I did, but I think there were several people ahead of me. Oh, no. Oh, oh, whoa. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in Jube. <laughs> thank you. I didn't <laughs> <see that. laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, Murray versus, versus Pearson, one, uh, 169 MD 478 182859. 0, 1936. The Maryland Court of Appeals ordered the University of Maryland Schools of Law to immediately integrate its student population since no comparable law schools existed for Black students. You have two generations of legal thinkers trying to draw on the lessons from Plessy versus Ferguson and construct a legal attack on segregation. It is believed that Plessy failed in part because racism in and of itself is designed to make white people immune to feeling the harms of it. So part of the strategy in attacking segregation through the courts was to position the segregation as close as possible to the experiences of the sitting judges themselves. You have this wave of cases involving white collar work, access to law school, access to medical school, access to graduate schools of education to try to get the judges to understand the context of segregation because 
it's in those professional class situations that the judges might be willing to give more credit to the concept of stigma, to the notion of intangibles, the very things they've used to succeed in their own lives. Equal, not only because it had inferior resources, but also on the basis of less objective measures, such as the experience and reputation of the faculty, the prestige of the instruction and its, um, and its alumni, and its correctedness to the broader legal profession. In Sweat versus Painter, Mr. Sweat, a Black man, successfully challenged a Texas state law on segregation by saying, I want to go to law school and the state provides no law school for Black students. So you've got to let me into the University of Texas at Austin Law School. Sweat's attack was successful, but rather than let him in, the judge said, we're going to just pause this litigation and let Texas go ahead and build a law school for black students. A separate law school for black students was built and the NAACP took it on further appeal, pass. Thank you so much, and Jobe. Whoever reads next, it looks like we jumped a page, and I apologize on my end. Uh, my zooming, my zooming in and zooming out was uh, beyond me. So it looks like we need to read Murray. Start at Murray was the first of those cases. Uh, that's Joshi next. Okay, awesome. Hi, Joshi. I won't read the photo caption. Murray was the first of those cases predating the victories of Sweat v. Painter and McLaurin v. Oklahoma State Regents by 14 years. It was the first time a state court ruled that the separate but equal doctrine was unequal. Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston and the other NAACP lawyers were trying out these theories in a state court that ultimately ended up being friendly to them. The success was a watershed but the question remained of how to translate it from one Maryland Court of Appeals decision to the entirety of the Deep South, the entirety of the nation. The NAACP attorneys and the attorneys who cooperated with them knew that to get this to work, the cases would have to be filed in the Deep South, they would have to lose in the Deep South, and they would have to do it in federal court so that they could build up cases that would reach the US Supreme Court and thus affect the whole nation. The target became schools of higher education. They knew that they needed to start with the doctors, the lawyers, and the educators before they could reach the children. Sweat v. Painter, 339, US 629, 1950. The Supreme Court ruled that the University of Texas Law School violated the Equal Protection Clause when rejecting an applicant on the basis of his race. The court also ruled that the newly created Texas State University for Negroes was not substantially equal, because, uh, not only because it had inferior resources, but also on the basis of less objective measures, such as the experience and reputation of the faculty, the prestige of the instruction and its alumni, and its connectedness to the broader legal profession. Pass. Thank you so much. So whomever reads next, we'll start at McLaurin v. Oklahoma State Regents. Wait, did we read in the momentous year of 1950? We did. Do we want to just read it again? Okay. To keep the flow? And Jobe um, uh, read that part. We okay. The page. Okay, sorry. Uh, next, next up is Camilla. Mm -hmm. McLaurin v. Oklahoma State Regents. 339 three, three, US. I'm not going to read that. Um, <laughs> The Supreme Court ruled that the University of Oklahoma could not provide different treatment to students on the basis of their race. This case, together with Sweat v. Painter, overturned the separate but equal doctrine in graduate and professional education. Mr. McLellan was a Black man who wanted to attend a graduate school of education. No such school existed for Black students in Oklahoma. The school admitted him in response to a lawsuit but gave him a separate table in the cafeteria and a cardened off place for him to sit alone just outside the classroom. This basically enforced, through boundaries both very visible and invisible, the racial hierarchy of Oklahoma and of our country, and the segregation that was fully ensconced in the law. Even when Black students were in the same settings as whites, these wins in the U.S. Supreme Court, sorry, <laughs> ensconced, even when Black students were in the same settings as whites. 
These wins in the U.S. Supreme Court were huge because the NAACP got the court to say it was not enough to simply build facilities for students. The settings had to be desegregated. And it was with those wins that the NAACP and its League of Cooperating Attorneys throughout the South developed the cases that became Brown v. Board of Education and its companion cases. Donna? After Brown, Brown v. Board of Education, 2, 349 U.S., 294, 1955. In Brown 2, rather than specify a deadline or particular models, am I right? Okay. Or particular models for school desegregation, the court ruled that school districts should desegregate, in quotes, with all deliberate speed using localized plans to be monitored by federal district courts. Brown too came about because in the momentous unanimous 1954 Brown decision, the court finally said separate but equal is inherently unequal. And we have to eliminate desegregation. We have to eliminate segregation in the public education of our students. The court did a somewhat novel thing in saying we've made this decision as to liability. We want to have you back in front of us next year to hear how we're going to implement it. What are we going to do to ask students, to ask schools to do when it comes to actually desegregating our schools? Round two, oh, should I keep reading or is that it? Hello? I'll, should I read the next one or? Was that two paragraphs? If you count the board. <laughs> yeah, just keep reading, Donna, go ahead. Okay. Round two, the 1955 decision was after arguments in which the NAACP and every state solicitor general or attorney general argued to the court what desegregation was going to look like in the context of the Brown one decision. Brown two reaffirmed the harm of, seg of segregation, but left things wide open for schools to figure out how they would desegregate, just noting that it had to be done in quotes with all deliberate speed. Thank you, Donna. Who's next? Virginia? I think I think I am. Yep. That language in some ways haunted implementation thereafter. Because as soon as Brown II was decided, all sorts of terrible new things started happening. Alabama removed the right to an education from its constitution. Mississippi did the same. Rather than actually integrate schools, places in Virginia and in the Mississippi closed not just a school but an entire public school system. Georgia adopted a constitutional amendment to deny funding to any district that desegregated. Academies and private schools that were designed to be white only popped up across the deep South. And in many cases, including those that were later legally challenged, they were funded directly by the state or subsidized by the state to sponsor the segregated education of its students. In places where at least some lift service was paid to an effort to desegregate schools, most of it was through freedom of choice plans. The idea essentially was, okay, black families, your kids can go to a white school now. You just have to choose it. You just have to be the one to do it. You just have to say it's going to be fine for your daughter and your son to go to this building where they will be mocked, vilified, and terrorized. And don't worry, we'll do that to your parents too. So although brave black families stood up and some brave white allies stood up as well, efforts to seriously implement the constitutional mandate that came about with Brown one and was reflected as all deliberate speed in Brown two met with, oh, one second, I just have to, um, uh, met with abject failure. Thank you. So oh, much. going to have, yeah, uh, that's the end, I think, for my two paragraphs. Yep. Malene? Brown 3, 1968 to 1974. Green v. County School Board of New Kent County, Virginia, 391 U.S. 430, 1968. The Supreme Court ruled that New Kent County's freedom of choice plan did not sufficiently desegregate the school system and established a set of factors to judge desegregation in New, Count, New Kent County 
and beyond using one student ass assignments, two faculty, three staff, four transportation, five extracurricular activities, and six facilities. 13 years later, the US Supreme Court was completely fed up with this failure to implement Brown. To implement Brown. In Green V County School Board of New Kent County, the court finally said enough. Desegregation must mean that there are no racially identifiable schools. The schools should reflect in their student enrollment, the approximate racial proportionality of the neighborhood and the city in which they are set. Similarly, it shouldn't be possible to identify the race of a school by looking at its teaching core. The faculty needs to be desegregated. And desegregation has not been accomplished until that there's greater parity in terms of physical plants. If 90% of the white kids are in a really nice new school with a nice new gym and nice new facilities, but nothing has been done to up upgrade the other facilities, you're never going to have any freedom of choice that you've been saying is what will be effective in desegregating schools. The court developed a list of, quote, green factors, which became the litmus test for a school district's desegregation. It's in this rush after 1968 that meaningful desegregation began to take place in the South. Ray? Okay, sorry. Just switching between tabs here. Okay, uh, Morgan V. Hennigan. 379 F Soup 410 D Mass 1974. Judge W. Arthur Garrity Jr. ruled that Boston School Committee was enforcing de facto segregation through policies that supported racial imbalance in public schools. So he enforced an an implementation plan based on redistricting and busing. To me, the Law Review article by Derek Bell called Serving Two Masters is a profound text because it shapes the central tension between civil rights attorneys who were trying to extend the fight and the victory from Brown across the South into North and into more racially isolated urban districts and black community members who had lost faith in the notion that ending segregation would secure a quality education for their children. Bell sets this discussion up around desegregation efforts in Boston. By the time Morgan v. Hennigan was filed in 1972, it was quite clear that racially discriminatory practices were at play in Boston's education system. Whether the seg segregation was de jure by law or de facto, the court found it either way in 1974. But implementing desegregation in Boston or in any other major northern or western city uh, produced the same white flight and hostile pushback as in the South, violence, threats, and harassment. That was perfectly captured in images from Southie. All this occurred at the same time that some of the healthiest and most restorative and communal things about Black schooling were being lost, such as a Black teaching core. So Black students lost the opportunity to be educated by Black teachers. Pass. Jillian. Is Jillian still here? Yep, sorry, I just needed to unmute, one sec. Um, most of us read the Bell article to mean that we had to stop thinking, I'm going to just file that perfect case and solve all our problems. Lawyers needed to think about how to support movement work. They have an ethical obligation as lawyers to listen to their clients and put power in their hands, not to win the perfect case. The conflict was between relying and and expanding on the NAACP strategy that had emerged over the past 40 years and losing the ability to listen and respond directly to the needs of the black community. That felt a lot like shuffling deck chairs on Titanic rather than addressing the central concerns about educational equality. Pass. Do you wanna uh, end us, uh, Matt? Um, if we rely on the courts to be a primary vehicle for social change, momentous decisions like Brown v. Board of Education can be achieved, but it can still be 13 years before people actually take the court seriously.
All right, thanks everyone. Um, okay, um, now we're gonna open it up. Um, and I, I have a tendency to enjoy starting with the discussant when they're in the room. Um, Matt, what does it feel like to hear your words read back to you by the group? Oh, it sounds much better when it's when it's this group. <laughs> I tell you that. <laughs> so, um. Um, uh, so now's the time when we make a, we take just like five or ten minutes for discussion, reflection, thoughts from the group about what's been read before we move on to the next chapter. Um, let me see what's happening in the chat. Thanks, Nia, for dropping the Derek Bell text in the chat. Um, thoughts, Sabello, what did, what did that feel like for you to, to hear this read aloud? Um, and I, I should note that I paired these two together for a reason. Um, our first, one of our first conversations are actually, yeah. Yeah, I think our first in-person conversation when this project began before we knew that we knew anything about COVID and all of that was with Matt um, in person at the Wallach House on the Radcliffe campus. Um, and it kind of set us up for these other conversations that would happen. Donna was our first conversation over Zoom. Sabello, we also spoke with in real life. And um, after, I think I'm the one who was, who was assigned with transcribing your text, Sabello, but it's in this beautiful rainbow, um, this, this, the, the order that, that, the, that the chapters are in um, came from Rachel Vogel. Who was, uh, who was our editor, our, our, our graduate professional student or PhD professional student editor. Um, and when we get to Sabello's text, we are going to explore personhood, the idea of personhood. Um, and I paired these two together because Matt's reflection on this case history really sets up for us who legally gets to be defined as a person deserving of education. Um, K. Anthony Jones, who was one of our um, graduate research assistants identified that literacy is a condition of um, democracy. So who deserves an education and thus access to the democratic process through literacy and then some. Um, I see Nia's hand is up. Go for it, Nia. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I was kind of uh, half listening, but also looking for some sources. So I'm not sure if you, <laughs> if the questions were for us to answer, but I just wanted to, um, uh just just talk about what i was struck with they weren't for us to answer okay All right. well there were no there were no questions i was just setting up for everyone that sabelo and matt i paired these two together tonight because they both take us through what it means to be a person um first through the this legal history of the united states around education and education being attached to how we experience life and how we're considered in the world and then sabelo is going to take us into uh ubuntu and what it means to be a person through a whole different lens but okay. nia go, go for it yeah, so I'm I'm so what what I'm kind of walking away with from this chapter is I'm I'm struck actually by the strategy conversation. Um and so I'm uh uh let's see really this kind of last piece um where Matt uh references Derek Bell um and uh some of the I guess kind of reflections or, or learnings from that moment and and I'm also looking at the um, captions on page 26 in the hard copy. I'm not quite sure what the um, what the what it would be in the uh, in the PDF. But these first couple of, of uh, captions are also referring to this. So it it says uh, Jewish lawyers and philanthropy in 1930s working to counter state sanctioned lynch lynching. Thurgood Marshall and NAACP taking on trials in South to call national attention to abuse, um, something double in the grove. It's on the next page. Um, it's the drawings, yeah. So that those first couple of drawings. And then this uh, second bullet point says, Jewish philanthropy asked to fund, to take on education, philanthropic ideals aligned with the work win-win. Makes you wonder about, reflect on how this change impact and efficacy. What if it was not just an ed focus? And I'm I'm, I'm presuming this was, these are more of Matt's words that are showing up in this drawing. Um, so again, just kind of thinking about that strategy piece, um, there's a there's an academic and maybe Matt, you know her, Megan Mean Francis, and she talks yes. about movement capture. And yes. she talks about exactly that. Yes. that <laughs> prevailing strategy was actually an anti-lynching strategy. And then with Brown uh, v. Board and some of these earlier cases, the focus shifted to education, which is important enough but as you as you ask or and as you ask matt um what if it was not 
a narrow focus on education? What if it actually was a little more, a little more broad? Um, you know, what would what would things look like if anti-lynching strategy had kind of been carried all the way through? But yeah, and you you uh yeah, I would just appreciate hearing more about that. You're you're exclaiming, yes, Matt. No, it's simply an agreement, but just to you know, to 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 double down on it, right? The the story of this strategy uh has been described in philanthropy circles as the great win-win, right? It was uh Jewish labor philanthropists who saw this as a chance uh to to counter racial discrimination in this country and funded came to the, the NAACP with the proposition to fund this work right to to basically attack segregation at its core and in doing so it it moved the you know the the barely resourced NAACP and it's still not born uh, legal defense fund uh, away from doing what Thurgood Marshall was doing, which was traveling by rail all across the country to small town after small town to take on uh, uh, these terrible uh, criminal cases um, that uh, uh, where um, where there was no justice, right? Um, and and you have to wonder if. You have you have all this black brilliance um, uh, in this this group of lawyers, right? Marshall, uh, Spotswood G. Robinson, Constance Baker Motley, soon, very soon, Polly Murray, right? Like this whole team, right? Um, and uh, and and you have to wonder if instead of devoting the effort to the philanthropic goal, right, that was going to fund the NAACP and expand its work. Um, uh, what what it would have been like if everything would have been focused on anti-lynching, right? What it would have been like if the NAACP's legal work was responsive not to philanthropy, but to what what evolved as a movement, right? What came through uh, Kingian nonviolence in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference? What came to to be in response to SNCC or to CORE or to the Panthers, right? Like this could have been a lot different if it hadn't been captured from the start. Amazing. Um, I'm so glad we're talking about this. You know, um, Matt, there was a chapter there was another case that I actually would have really loved to be included in this rundown, the right to read case in Detroit. I don't know yeah. if I'm wilding out, but let's pause actually on, on my commentary because Ray said that they were they were really intrigued by the long-term strategy the layers took, mm. uh, the layers took to lose in the South uh, to be able to build an important national movement. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, this is look. This is this is just brilliant. What um, uh, Charles Hamilton Houston, Thurgood Marshall, this whole team of of lawyers came up with, uh, because uh, there is there is no way to read Plessy v. Ferguson as anything but a fiction when read against the Fourteenth Amendment and its Equal Protection Clause. Right, the two can't coexist together. Right, in the same way. Uh, any of the language in the Constitution around equality and liberty can coexist with bondage, can coexist with the failure to provide the right to vote to women, to Native Americans, uh, or to people, anybody besides white male property holders. Right. So, um, so it, it's it's hard to read any of this language and hope to find truth in it. Right. Um, it, when when you look at the Brown decision, I honestly think it's very little different, right? Like um, what what you have in what you have in Brown is a very short but unanimous opinion from the court that basically says because state sponsored segregation creates a stigma for black children to believe that they are inferior to white children, it does a harm that we have to undo. Thurgood Marshall, Constance Baker Motley, Spotswood G. Robinson, all these folks spent 
the entirety of their legal profession and most of their lives coming up with the most difficult arguments and, and you know, threading every needle that they could to try to convince this country that by its own laws, it was unjust, right? Um, and when the court finally gets around to correcting that and correcting Plessy v. Ferguson and the notion of separate but equal, right? It, it hangs it on some flimsy social science research, right? Um, because that's the that's the one thing that the Supreme Court could get every justice to agree on as a reason to to overturn separate but equal as a doctrine for equal protection. Okay, the the point is, right, like all of this is a lie, right? All of this is a lie that we've been telling ourselves as a nation um, since before it was founded, and uh, and the. You know, the story of Brown is the story of the bravery of the families who stood up um, to take this fight locally, right? Brave families who said, I'm not going to have my kids walk seven miles to school when there's a white school nearby, right? And it's the stories of brave and smart attorneys who put their heads together uh, uh, to beat white supremacists by their own words and by their own laws um, and undo the legal fiction uh, that was that was terribly, terribly real in the Jim Crow South and across the country. Right? So, um, you know, it, it, it's 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 just to me, anytime you read these things, it just feels like juxtaposing black brilliance with with white mediocrity. Right. Um, and it's good that it came out on the right side on paper. But as your as your work shows, uh, it's a damn shame that it took uh, so long for any of this to get put into even the beginning of practice. Thank you so much, Matt. Niamh, there's a, is there anything else in the chat? I think we should move on. Um, it's just, there's never enough time, actually. My my ideal for this workshop, for the, these book clubs is that we would meet for two hours, but, you know, I can never get enough of a good thing. Um, Nia, am I am I missing anyone in the chat or can we move on? We're good to move on, but although um, uh, Jamin just asked, Jamin has a question. Okay, great. Jamin, why don't you close us out before we move on to Sabelo's chapter and just to get some of y'all ready on in the hard copy, that's gonna be page 85 and page something else in the PDF. Jamin, what, what's on your mind? Yeah, um, maybe too big a question, but for Matt, um, reading through your narrative of the case history, it, reminds me of all the ways we're seeing a recapitulation of a lot of these strategies along mm -hmm. different fault lines, you know, in particular, freedom of religion certainly is one example where you right. see the First Amendment being mobilized uh, to um, maintain forms of segregation in education in particular. I, so I guess I'm just sort of curious, um, as we've walked through this case history, like, does this case history tell us anything about how to understand or um, intervene or think about the ways in which the old, the bigger questions of um, equal protection and personhood are being eroded on different in different kind of <laughs> uh, frameworks right now. Yeah, um, it's a it's a beautiful question, Jamin, and and a terrifying one too, right? Uh, um, you know, the uh, to 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 start with uh, Audrey Lord, right? The you know, the master's tools can never be used to dismantle the master's house, right? Um, and 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 uh, and as brilliant as the arguments were marshaled in in the Brown cases. As you know, they're being argued against us, right? Uh, when it came to the voluntary integration cases of uh, Seattle and, and Louisville, the court said the best way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race, right? Uh, don't do things that could affirmatively uh, or voluntarily integrate these schools and, and have a diverse and representative student body, right? Um, this, is, this is dangerous stuff, right? Um, and, Derek Bell said that the only reason that 
Brown was decided this way was we had to show the rest of the world that was moving toward communism that, no, 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 we're not actually that bad here in the United States. And uh, this way we can modernize the South in the process, right? Um, so, uh, so it's hard not to look at these wins through this lens of interest convergence. And it's hard not to see this time as one in which the interests are converging in an entirely different direction. Right. So what just gives me hope is that if this stuff is pendular, that we can swing it back with the right creative folks um, and perhaps more importantly, um, the right organizers and and families standing up so that uh, the justices can see this through a lens that doesn't simply lend itself to the law. Thank you so much, everyone. Um... We got to keep on moving, but hold all of this in your heart and your mind and consider this in conversation with um, where we're going next. All right, so let's continue reading. Well, we're and just to oh, read yeah. out loud real quick, Tamashi, we did get a couple more comments. So Donna okay. said, I keep going back though to Dr. King and James Baldwin's estimation that uh, we integrated into a burning house. Um, and uh, Sabelo then had a comment that which he said leads up to his piece. I'll just read it which is uh, my comment was one, that it's interesting how the rules of the system can be used to sort of change the system. Two, reminds me of the first public schools in Boston, Massachusetts, where Prince Hall and other black folks successfully sued to end slavery. Again, having to use the laws to show how irrational the system is. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Nia. Thanks everyone. Let's continue reading. Let's start reading Sabela's chapter. Um, let's all turn in the hard copy to page 85. And in the PDF, page 45. Okay, and then we'll read and pause for reflection again. And I'm just gonna do a, a, a quick introduction of our discussant, a more current one from his own website. Sabello's work uses Sub-Saharan African epistemologies and ontologies as a decoloniality framework whose goal is a more humane and equitable world. His work on the intersection of ethics, technology, and human rights is founded on the proposition that global equity and equality cannot be achieved without a fundamental restructuring and freeing of the physical and spiritual spaces governed by coloniality. More succinctly, ethics, technology, and human rights must question their default Euro-North American center and the coloniality often veiled and perpetuated as progress and modernity in order to achieve global equality. As a computer scientist, sub and researcher, and fellow at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and a technology and human rights fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, Sabello, Sabello's focus on the ethical implications of uh, technology in the developing world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, along with the creation of tools that make artificial intelligence more accessible and inclusive to underrepresented communities. He's interested in tools and policies that can improve the intelligence of machines and its benefits to the most disenfranchised communities while securing and maintaining the rights and sovereignty of marginalized communities. Um, and I'll just close out here. Some of his current technical projects include the creation of national language processing models for African language, AI for low resource environments such as web browsers and mobile devices, alternative design and web platforms for decentralizing data and an open source library for online networks. There's another bio too, but you know, there's just so much with this person. Okay, so we're going into on Ubuntu and the relationship between political systems and cultural conceptions of personhood. Um, All uh, right, and we're Sabella starting. Mlambi. And, yeah. and, and I'll, just, I'll just say this, Mlambi discusses in this chapter, Mlambi discusses how a society's political and legal systems reflect cultural conceptions of personhood. He draws out the assumptions underlying Western humanistic thought in which personhood is defined in terms of the individual rational actor. Mlambi contrasts this with Ubuntu philosophy, which is based instead on an ethics of relationality. Okay, and we're starting with Mars. All right, the research I have been doing is around ethics, personhood, and what it means to be human, and how to create laws and structure that can support our basic needs as human beings. What I do in my work is focus on the traditional view of personhood defined in Western society. 
and then follow the logistic impl implications of that worldview. If you define a person this way, what are the resultant economic structures? What are the resultant political structures? What are the resultant laws? How do we see human rights? In order to protect humans, you need to first define those things that are so important about being human and what it means to be a person in the first place. Yes. Gia? Thank you. Different societies have different views of what it means to be a person. And I think that looking at the history of the United States, we can see the ramifications of the version of personhood that we have today. What does it mean to be a person in Western society? To be a person is essentially to be rational. This is a definition we encounter with the earliest Greek philosophers. Aristotle, for example, says man is a rational animal. Descartes, who is known as the father of modern philosophy, says, I think, therefore I am. You also have the famous German ethicist Immanuel Kant, who he defines ethics as something that's rational. All of personhood becomes tied to this concept of rationality, and from there we see other systems such as capitalism built for the rational person, for free agents to make rational choices in a free market. You want to take the next paragraph, Gio? Yes. So we have this idea of rationality as the essence of personhood. Now, what are the political implications of defining personhood this way? Being rational is fundamentally an, an individual behavior, an individual quality. It's not a group activity to be rational. You, as an individual, just have to think and therefore you are. From there, we can more broadly understand and examine the history of laws and principles that are based on individualism, and specifically this idea that you have to allow the rational person to be as independent as possible to use the fullest extent of their individual rationality. Eric von K.L., last name, Liberty or Equality, talks about the idea that either we can be equal or we can have liberty, but we have to choose one. In the United States, there's this idea that we're all created equal before the law, that we all deserve the same dignity. But there's a difference between having legal equality and having true equality. And Oh yeah, I was reading off the shared screen. <laughs> um, okay, smooth. And it turns out that the founders of this country did not believe in true equality, which is obvious because they owned slaves while they signed the Declaration of Independence. Jamin? When you follow it all the way through, this Western idea of the human and the pursuit of individualistic liberty produces inequality. And the founders of this country knew that but used the idea of rationality to justify the systems and social orders they were establishing. It was needed, for example, to justify the enslaving of Africans and the destruction of other indigenous cultures under this idea that they'd make these people more rational, more intelligent, more productive. Many of the inhumanities in history have been rationalized. In the popular literature, this is called the irrationality of rationality. History shows that while trying to pursue rationality, there's been the irrationality of enslavement, subjugation, colonization, disenfranchisement, segregation. It creates inequality. So what we're seeing today and what we've seen in history is not a coincidence. It's the logical outcome of this definition of personhood that says an individual is self-sufficient and autonomous. This is where my research into computer science and AI comes in, because these are the same principles that we're putting into the creation and use of technology today. It is based on the same idea that rationality will solve everything. If we have AI rationality, we can have mastery over everything, nature, society, economy, etc. But this leads to the same conclusions, whether digital or in society, we see the inequalities that it creates. Donna? 
I've been thinking about Brown v. Board of Education. Yes, we have school integration, and that's great. Still, though, Black children are more likely to be punished in schools. In fact, Black girls are twice as likely to be suspended from school, and that is another form of segregation. Despite the laws, people find ways to express their true beliefs. The sociologist Ruha Benjamin says, racism is productive. It makes sense. It's rational to some people, for instance, in the way it's used to supply the prison industry, the prison industry with free labor. So people have rationalized their racism because of their internal biases and because it's actually productive for capitalism. How do you get the, how do you get the outcomes we need? We need relationality and new ways of being to bring more equality into society. Um, should I go to the next page? From Sabato yep. to everyone? Nor does the language show any structural inferiority. Indeed, in this respect, it, is absolutely out, it absolutely outclasses many of our European languages. And had it been planned by one of our most, more, most modern inventive geniuses, it could scarcely have been better modeled. In the hands, so to say, of one expert in its use, is capable of expressing anything in the run of ordinary life in a manner as perfect and oftentimes in an easier and cleaner, clearer way than in English. No reasonable person would expect it to have already made provision for all these, all those abstract ideas, scientific facts, and paraphernalia of civilized life, which had never yet come within the sphere of its experience. And yet it carries within itself ample power and resources for answering all those requirements. Owning to its unrivaled bonomatopsetric, bonomatopsetic capacity, capabilities, it provides both a medium of lifelike expression that the cleverest European raconteur could never aspire to and offers an ever ready means for the coining of endless new words, indeed in certain respects. I think that's it. From sob so to everyone. If the naming of things follows a principle of describing their function, appearance, sounds, and relationships, not merely to identify and label them, it is from such a study that one can amass and trace some of the fundamental philosophies of the culture. From sob so to everyone. Uh, hold on a second. Person, umo ntu, people, aba ntu, philosophy, uba ntu, culture is tu. From Sasso to hum everyone, I am the face of humanity. The face of humanity is my face. I am father, mother, child. I am the past, the present, and the future. Camilla? Um, to protect humanity, we need a philosophy whose essence is the protection of humanity, mm -hmm. uplifting the humanity of others. We know the result of a philosophy that says, I'm a person because I'm an individual, self-complete and rational. There are several other philosophies we can look to. What I focus on is Ubuntu philosophy. It's a Pan-African philosophy or humanism that asks, what is the purpose of humanity? How should we live together? How should we respond to one another and the world? Ubuntu is indigenous to Southern Africa. And in my research, I focus on Ubuntu in the Southern African content, but you'd be surprised. You encounter similar principles in surprising detail among other Africans on the continent and in the diaspora. Ubuntu means being a person, becoming a person. Mm -hmm. It translates it translates to a set of different principles and talks about relationality and relationships. Its most well-known definition is that a person is a person through other persons. Ubuntu says it's how we relate to other people that defines our own personhood. So it's a personhood that understands that we're all interconnected, living on a shared planet. If we follow through with the logic of Ubuntu, that we are all interconnected and working to improvise, to improve and exist in society better. We produce people who 
are more invested in taking care of one another. Dignity is at the core of relationality. I have to respect your differences and we have to come together to live as a society. Matt? Fractals, a pattern that repeats itself at different scales and is nature's most basic pattern, are a big part of African design and aesthetics and also of Ubuntu. At the heart of Ubuntu is this idea of fractals, a kind of oneness and relationality that produces its community and social relationships. Equality, restoration, reconciliation, restorative justice become organic outcomes of thinking and living with Ubuntu. In Ubuntu, the individual has great importance because they are individual, the individualized expression of the collective and ultimate reality. That's profound because it requires us to build societies together in which there is more harmony, where we're more connected so that we can all prosper, where we can have more life and dignity. Humanism, in this Ubuntu sense, is relational fundamentally connected to other humans. And this is how we care for and protect one another. We have to ask for and work toward the moral guarantees we need to allow people to become collective selves. This is the question of human rights. How can we build societies in which all people can fully participate, fully dream? Ubuntu pushes us toward this goal by telling us that we are all deeply interconnected, and that the individual becomes an ethical member of society by aligning their destiny with those around them, bringing their gifts and skills in harmony with those in their community. Woo! <laughs> We're not done, but uh, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, I want to pause for a minute um, because we're going just a little bit over and I want to take a picture um, before we lose any more people. So if you feel comfortable turning on your camera, if you have your book, you can hold it up. And if you don't, just uh, show us that you were here today. That would be awesome. Um, Sabelo, I gave you like three books, but you are also globetrotting. So, <laughs> okay. One, two, Oh shoot, sorry, I did it wrong. You want to stop the share? Nope. No, um, okay. Oh, oh yeah, I'll, I, did I stop? I'm sorry, I didn't stop the share, my bad. Okay, I could see all of you. One, two, three. Thanks everyone, I got that. Okay, let me return to my script. Okay, so let's pause for reflection and discussion. The chat is open. And so is the floor. Um, Louise said, uh, okay, well, first, and Jobe said, how do we see human rights? In order to protect humans, you need to first define those things that are so important about being human and what it means to be a person in the first place. Whew. Matt said, I agree with, agree with Louise. It's hard to look at the constitution, Plessy or Brown and feel like there's anything rational to our treatment of race. I love the way this chapter takes this apart and rebuilds through Ubuntu. Um, and then Joshi said, the toxicity of individualism runs deep. All right, I see Louise's hand up. Go for it, Louise. Reading this chapter made me think of a book that I got was How Religion Supports Sustainability. I forget the author, I think that's it. And it goes like, it goes like the age of enlightenment, it says was at the age of explo exploitation. They said, they taught God gave us the earth for us to use. And they and they concentrated like on one molecule, not how some things, and they didn't look, you did some created the medicine or adjusted one molecule. They didn't look on how it affected the rest of the society. You know, that was sort of the, uh, the rationality. They didn't look, then the next part was community that we, we, it was shared together and spiri, spir, spirituality. And it makes me think like uh, one church I went to, the Christian Advent, uh, they, they taught us that um, 
that the earth with uh, we were guardians of the earth to take care of the earth and to share it and they preached against excessive wealth so trump and the owls would be uh, sinners and they um i mean they were strict on sexuality and that they were strict but they didn't shove it down other people's throat but they said but they blame religion for keeping people down but they did we but they did preach self-sustainability, taking care of yourself, not just not getting real rich. And they also said that there are people worse off than you are, and the, the, and, 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 and the supply resources are unlimited, you know, they taught us. That was the uh, right way uh, to do, do things, you know, and that was the Christian advent. So it makes me think, you know, that's in that way the religion was helpful. Because I think sometimes looking at individuals, I don't like sometimes like in racism. Well, I have a class chip on my shoulder. Like so many upper class look down, they don't respect the trades and everything. And so they say, well, the husband beat the boss gets after the husband, the husband beats the wife and the dog, and and then the kid wife beats the kids and the kids kick the dog. Like yeah. I mean, that individualism. And people don't think when you do that, the impact that it has on it. And I was a little thing. I grew a little, when I was living in Guatemala, was a toddler. And I remember, like, my father set, put me away when my mother was in the hospital. And the, the maid uh, 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 saved me. And I have, still have the doll she gave me for my third birthday. Louise? And the first, and the first thing I came to this country, I remember missing Guatemala. It makes me think, I wonder how much they that that India that, that culture influenced my thinking. Thank you so much, Louise. There's um, a question for Sabelo in the chat. Yes, and also and I have a question for Sabelo as well, which is how did it feel to hear your words read back to you by the group? Um it always was strange because I'm self-conscious, but um <laughs> But uh, I'm glad to uh, hear the uh, the impact and what um, and how it resonates with with uh, so many people in uh, many different ways. Um, so re regarding the onomatopoeic um, question, it's like a poetic device. Um, so like we had a long conversation, and so we didn't put the entire. That's why you you're not seeing the full um, context. But uh, I was quoting um, this missionary who came to South Africa in the 1800s, and he made the first English to Zulu dictionary or Zulu to English dictionary. And so um, so like he was writing and saying like I can't believe like this language by savages is so is quite actually well developed. Uh, even if the best linguist in Europe were to make a new language from scratch, they would not even come, like, they wouldn't match the quality of this language. And so, like, I was just quoting uh, what I was saying. And so he was describing, like, the different poetic devices that you find within many African languages. And so um, this particular device is, like, um, when the naming, when the, uh, when this, when the word that describes something is the sound of that thing so like buzz like it be buzzes like that's really what it, you know uh, what that means and so you find um like so many you know poetic devices within like you know african languages and so it makes it easier and much more um fluid to describe so many different things so that was the context behind that there's another question for you i believe it's for sabelo uh, from Gio. Gio, do you want to read your question out loud? Yes, thank you. And um, I'll, tr uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, what are your thoughts when European colonialism in the past told us that our cultures are wrong, primitive, and even demonic, and now seeks our ancestral philosophies to remedy their moral failures? And just like for context, like I grew up hearing Ubuntu, when I went to go visit my family um, in a place called Nizna. I'm not uh, sure if you're familiar with that area, but it was, it continues to be like a, a living, breathing uh, philosophy there. And then coming back into Boston, um, you can hear that in boardrooms when people slap five 
and try to hype each other up, you know, for the for the next business acquisition. So it's just very strange uh, to me. And I wanted to know what are your thoughts as well? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it goes back even to the previous chapter, like this whole irrational belief system. Like it just like if you just look at it like face value, it just doesn't make sense. Like um, it contradicts itself. And so like racism is a contradiction because if you're a human being, according to Ubuntu, you cannot as a human being treat, treat, treat another person inhumanely. Right, because it takes a human being to see another human being. So if you've lost the ability to see someone else as a human being, you've lost your own humanity. And so to then be inhumane is a contradiction of being human. So racism, so like this, you know, colonization, racism, and it's just like again, it's the it's the irrationality of you know this, you know, philosophy, which was forced on everyone else. So we were not wrong or primitive. We were just it was forced upon it like being like you know this um individualistic culture and society was forced upon us through violence through force through you know plunder and colonization so you know if we like now we're essentially saying might is right you know like because there were they you know better weaponry or more savagery then you know their system philosophy is better and you know that's not even a, an argument that is logical so like it's just it's entirely irrational like i think so <laughs> those are my thoughts nia what do you what did you think about this chapter i'm not going to answer that <sighs> what i am going to do is read jason's uh, comment in the chat who said i uh, i think you landed the plane really beautifully in your closing last three paragraphs. It brought to mind many things, in but in particular that Lucille Clifton line, all of us are all of us. Um, and then and then actually Rebecca has a question, which funny enough, in my mind, I was fashioning a question around AI, but Rebecca has a question. Do you want to read your question aloud, Rebecca? She just had eye surgery. She needs us to do it. Okay. All right. Uh, so in the chat, thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca said, asking because I truly don't know the answer. Are there examples of AI or computer science that do not reconstitute the system of encoded bias and rationality will solve it outlook? What, if anything, has changed in these areas since this publication? Well, I don't, I don't think much has changed. Um, except um, there's more papers and work that um, is trying to move the industry towards relying purely on logic and, and uh, rationality as like the source of truth, uh, the way to move forward, you know, like AI will solve many things is what we're told. It's gonna make us make society better. Um, even, even here in the African continent, you know, People are looking to technology, to AI as like this, you know, um, uh, solution to everything, but really it's not. And uh, the, quickly, the so like, how could AI look differently, for example? Uh, so, uh, you know, something quite interesting, um, it was shared by a professor from uh, Michigan, um, Ron Aglish, and he was saying that um, he was able to demonstrate that African divination is really what led to programming. The binary system is an African way of counting. It's common in Western Africa all the way to Eastern Africa. And um, the way you do divination um, uh, in the African continent, it's not like you know someone just divines for you and then they tell you like, okay, tomorrow you're gonna win $10 million or whatever. Um, or like, hey, you know, you're gonna get married or you're gonna win the war or whatever. Uh, it's like a bi-directional system. So like you have the diviner and the person getting the, cons the doing the, uh, getting the consultation and they're going back and forth and, and anybody can reject and say, no, no, I don't agree with that. So it's more like collaborative. Now, AI is like divination. You're essentially predicting the future based on this input, what's going to happen in the future. And it's like a one-way street. It's like the computer says, well, I've done all the calculations and this is what's going to happen. So like, you don't often have um, this like um, going back and forth between, you know, 
to two different parties uh, trying to come together to a source of truth, trying to reconcile rather than trying to impose the one way of being. You're trying to, in harmony, say, well, okay, well, what do you think? Okay, how about this? How about that? And then together you um, you, 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 you can get to that. So I think uh, we have a way of how we can even think of what artificial intelligence could look like if um, we didn't have like this unidirectional source of truth. Thank you so much, Sabello. And Jill Bay's hand is raised and I just want to, um, uh, Perla, if you want to come in after Njobe, and then we should close. Um, Perla said, they're so grateful to be here. They said, quote, my humanity is bound up in yours, and we can only be human together. Desmond Tutu came to their mind. Njobe, what's up? Yeah, I just I just wanted to thank you, and I just wanted to ask this one question, and I'm, I too went down to the, the drawing, and it says, um, Ubuntu is beyond what English language can describe. And that really hit me um, because one of the principles my employer and my employment we, we try to follow is uh, the idea of Ubuntu. And if if it's beyond what English language can actually describe, no, this, this, seriously, like being, you know, from this, from, from America, being, you know, generationally uh, descendant of American slavery, how is it that we could actually collectively, right, hold the idea or really the philosophy and in action, in our actions um, with this idea of Ubuntu? Like, um, I know it's a lot. It's a lot to kind of think about. <laughs> but is, well, there, is there just, yeah, what would you say to that? I, I think to be fair, even um, though, you have African people who are enslaved in America who may not speak um, African languages. Um, I still find that, you know, Ubuntu is still very prevalent and prominent even within the African diaspora. Which, um, and so I think uh, it's a way of embodying it. Um, when, what I meant about um, the English language is that it's, it's quite difficult to try to put it into like um, the true truest essence, um, because uh, it, within the yeah right the the etymology, you know like within the word itself, there's this idea that you're becoming something right. So you're not even born a person. I didn't quite put that in the paper, but you sort of become a person. It doesn't mean you don't have human rights or whatever. It just means um you might be a biological person, but your high self, your fullest completion, only happens through harmony with others like there's no other way it's when you step into your how you're connected to everyone else into everything else that's when you begin to experience what it really means to be to be um, a person but um this idea is just captured so well in just ubuntu like if like just the etymology itself so it's easier to express what i've just said to you in like two paragraphs but just saying ubuntu so uh, that's what i was trying to say uh, um about that but I think the main idea still is that, um, um, uh, you know, we're, we're never complete on our own, right? So if like, you know, the work that, uh, you know, you might be doing with your employer or the Ujima project in Boston with the neighborhoods and um, the local communities, that's the only way you come to completion, to really become a person, to really have, to really have personhood. And beyond that, you cannot, you can never, and I feel like that's what our um, our colonizer brothers and sisters and, and people fail to realize that, you know, what they were doing actually made them less human and made them inhumane. And so, um, you know, we now have, you know, the world we have today. Um, and the way to reverse that is to, to see that, you know, we're literally incomplete without each other. There's a question. Do you have other writing we can read, Sabelo? Anything we can... <laughs> Drop in the chat right now. Any titles we should look up? Yes, yes. Um, uh, let me look it up really quick. I only have like one paper that I wrote actually. Um, and uh, uh, let's see here, where is it at? Oh my god, if you like Google, like Google like Harvard personhood and put my name, you'll probably see it. But okay, here we go. I'll That's just one. drop those. Okay, I was going to drop those terms in the chat for people. And then a comment from Jamin, 
Uh, Jamin said, I was struck in particular by the sentence at the end of the paragraph introducing Ubuntu, page 97. Dignity is at the core of relationality. Maybe because hearing dignity foregrounded as a way to counter the pervasive, tired, meaningless term empathy. Thank you to Balo and Matt, whose case history I think tells us the potential limits of empathy as a basis of intervention. Huh. Can I respond quickly to that? Um, like the especially the dignity part. Um, it's essentially one to saying that um, you have dignity because you can never not belong, because we're all interconnected. So because I'm part of everything. And because I belong, that's where my dignity comes from. Not because I've earned dignity. Like, you know, if you're an individual, you have to earn it, right? You have to right, use your rationality, use your efforts, you, you know, um, and build yourself up. But in African societies, your dignity is because you belong and you can never not belong because we're always interconnected, no matter what. And everything else is an illusion that we're not interconnected. And so that connectedness guarantees your status that I belong, therefore I have dignity, and that can never be taken away from me. This has been amazing, everyone. Thank you so much, Sabello. Matt? Before I completely land this plane, any thoughts or feelings in response to the text of your fellow discussant? I'm just going to sit here speechless and enjoy this. <laughs> this has really been amazing. Thank you, Ujima Project, for um, for hosting this uh, Ashe Ashe Cultural Assembly um, session four. We have one more. They've been kind enough to uh, indulge me. I've asked for one more session in February to start off Black History Month so we can go out appropriately. Um, and Matt and Nia and Donna, um, I will be reaching out to each of you in the hopes that you'll join me in um, discuss reading, discussing and reflecting upon Constance Baker Motley, Polly Murray and Ruth Batson. I feel like that's a chapter we didn't get into quite enough. And we need some of you who really understand the histories of those lives and what they mean to us all now to flesh that out. Um, thank you so much, Sabello. We're gonna let you go to sleep now. Um, thank you everyone for being here with us. And um, a reminder if you, a rem or last reminder, if you do not already have the hard copy and would like one, sign up at the Boston Ujima Project website and we'll either deliver a copy to your home or I'll mail it to you. Thank you all for spending time together in the Brown 2 Book Club. We are, we've already taken our family picture, so we can just say goodbye. And I'll see you, we'll see you next could, month. Could I just ask with, where this recording is going to be? Can we get it? Can we yep. see it? it? It goes on our YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Awesome. Be awesome. well. Good night, y'all. Bye, Jason. Bye, Bye. 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 Love you, Catherine. Love you, Connie. Love you, Keisha. Love you, Jill. Happy New Year. Bye, Joy. Bye.